a deer is mesmerized by a sound. So the hunter goes after the deer with sweet music. The elephant, during mating season, all they want to do is touch. And so there are these like pits that are creeping. And I can you press that? Oh, you did? Oh, great. Um, there are these pits that the hunters do because the, the elephants are so enthralled with like the touch of one another, they don't notice and they fall into the pits and then they take them and steal the ivory. The bees are, of course, going flower to flower, collecting the honey, and then the humans come and take the honey. The moths are ignited with like the, the fire, the sight, so they're like drawn to that flame. And the fish are gluttonous, and all they want to do is eat. So if you think of each one of these examples, these animals are just enthralled by one sense, and it means death for them, pretty much. Imagine us that have five senses. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> the dramatic but not the okay, but so we're constantly in this battle of which sense are we going to kind of please and be stimulated by and be attracted by. Um, so there's two kinds of sense perceptions. One is the shreya, and one is the praya. The shreyas and the prayas. So the shreyas is what, what we were talking about, Diana, that she wakes up every morning to do her, her fire, even though she doesn't want to, is when we do something that we know is ultimately good for us. So we sort of like force it and we do it because we know that there's good action. Whereas the prayas is when we indulge. So I had the example of chocolate and I had brought chocolate. So we know it's chocolate. We want more and more and more. Luckily, she limited it to a yes. Because <laughs> if not, if you're like the fish and gluttonous, then you're going to eat more and more and more. So the prayas is what is dear to your senses, where the shreyas is what you know is ultimately good for you. So you defy your senses, or you do you eat the broccoli instead of the, the let's say, the chocolate. What is the prayas? The prayas is what is dear to your senses, something that is constantly liked by your senses. So Mark Twain says, I know the secret of life. Everything that I like, don't do it. Everything that I don't like, indulge in it. Then I'll live a long and happy life. <laughs> so this is the concept of the shreyas and the prayas. So if you don't like broccoli, eat it. If you like chocolate, I don't like it. putting away clothes, maybe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's so that the senses don't become our master, which is ultimately why when we have a tool like the mind, we cannot be in control of it because our senses are constantly you know, enticing us to do other things. And they work together. And so that's why the mind is the idea, which is the sense and the motor function. And the senses participate in that external seeking. I want more and more and more because the, the senses cannot get enough. Okay. So put your pens and everything down. And then take your thumbs and press on your ear inside, <coughs> inside your lobe. And put your fingers on your eyes. Your break finger on. I can't hear you. What was that? The ring finger on your two nostrils. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, right, that's true. <laughs> and then your pinky over your mouth. I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You can uncover. Paul is very. So, what do you experience when you cover up the senses? Silence. You can shut this down. When we talk about meditation, when we talk about prayer, when we talk about you know, changing, it's to silence those senses. So we can do this at any point in our day 
we can decide to honor these senses and to be basically dictated dictated <coughs> senses or to calm them and shut them down. Okay. So the mind, the, the senses actually live in our subtle body. Um, the mind uses the senses as like overload, like to seek into that, that attainment of desire. But we can calm that down. And it's through our practices, it's through our spiritual practices, it's through you know control of the mind that we that we have that ability. And so we're not obligated to be, you know, slaves to what's going on outside. We really, we can listen to that sort of inner silence and connect to that. And then we can find what everybody wrote when they define themselves, their true nature, that child of God, that divine spark. There's a prayer in Vedic medicine that goes Andhra Pashe. Let my ears hear only good things in the world. Let my eyes see only good. May my senses only ingest nobility, and may my body convert from only the positive experiences. So when we see good, and we've talked about a little bit about nutrition through the senses, that we're getting our food through what we see, what we hear, what we say. And so that goes back to paying attention to what you're saying, to what you're seeing, to where you're putting your time. So we were just talking about a book, about this gentleman in India and all the beauty. I mean, I, Paula and I were taken away with Leela's description of the book. It's a 900 page book. I have no time and I'm gonna buy it. And I, we're taken away with these stories. We just can be transported at any moment, anywhere. Transport yourself through good company, through good movies, through good music. That's why we listen to the uplifting. Because then that's converted into positive and into health, into the body. Do we have a book? No, I can give it to you. I can print it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So what do we know about the mind? Why is the mind different or similar from the body, or the physical body, as we can see? Because it's part of the train, we can't train the mind. I mean, mystery, not a monkey mind. Definitely a mystery, a mystery. monkey mind, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Is it material? <coughs> Is it observable? Is it not the mind? Yes. So it it is. Is. So certain, certain things. I, I don't think that it's material. That the physical body is tangible. We can observe it, we can see it, we can touch it. It makes us feel. That's why so many of us get confused and think we are this body. But the mind is observable. And we've talked about a certain thing, and you can see how somebody closes themselves off or how they're thinking about something. So it's definitely observable. And is it tangible? Why? Why? The thoughts have energy and energy manifests, it manifests itself and energy is tangible. That manifestation is tangible. It absolutely is. You'll see when we do the chakra when I teach you to kind of go into your energy field. If I take this and I move this to here, you saw me doing that. I can do the exact same thing with your aura, with your energy field, with the energy in your chakra. We're moving stuff out. We absolutely can. What makes something tangible? Go back to Sankhya. Prana. Go denser. Movement. Denser. Vedanas. Uh, the Mahabhutas. The Mahabhutas. So does the mind have the Mahabhutas? Of course. A version of it. We've got earth. We've got air. We've got fire. And we're going to go through that. So you can see that there is a tangible nature to the mind. Something like just a, a way to kind of put that into perspective that I was reading. I forget one of the readings. It was that every single thing in the manifest you know, universe, like this table, the statue, the blackboard, your couch, <coughs> all started with the thought. And it could not be 
in existence without a thought. So that's, yes. And so in the Vedas, and there is one mind. We're going to go through the levels of mind. In hermetic philosophy, the metaphysical laws, when you were talking about knowing the laws of the universe, and that really is our saving grace. If you understand the laws of the universe, then you understand how this magnificence works, how you work everything. So many people are ignorant of those laws. That's why we study this. No matter which, again, philosophical system, that's what you're educating yourself to understand. In Hermetic philosophy, the first law, the first metaphysical law, is all is mind. Every single thing is mind. The root book is the Kabbalion. Yes, the Kabbalion. It's free. It's very skinny. Online PDF free. It's amazing. The seven laws that the universe. The Kabbalion. By Hermes Trismegistus. That is the book before Ayurveda found me, and I understood the, you know, the teachings of the Vedas. Um, that was my overriding philosophy. And so they have the seven laws of the universe, many that you already believe in, one being cause and effect and karma. So when we understand that we have these laws and we understand how the universe works, then we're not so lost. To me, my way of thinking, this world makes no sense. You kill a man, you can get off scot-free, you can get life, or you can get two years. What consistency is in that? But I know that if I think something, that it is going to come back to me exactly. It's going to manifest. That makes perfect sense. So for us that are in this, you want to have that knowledge. And so that's where you see that the mind at a subtler form is tangible. Because if it's made up of the essence of the Panchamahabhutas, of the Tamantras, then you see that it is a denser form of Purusha, which started it all. And there it goes back to all is one, all is mind. And mind dictates everything. And mind is our perception. And mind is what's happening in your life. And you just see it's a vicious cycle. You can never get out of this because all of them are connected. Okay. So that's one of the main... Um, I'll tell you in a second. We'll get to the, the senses. I just don't want to lose my, my order. So we talked a little bit about the mind. We're going to go more in depth. We talked about the body being a gross manifestation of the mind. What about the spirit? What kind of things, and we talked about, um, you know, your philosophy of life, but what kind of things do you do for your spirit? Pray. Okay. Chanting. Chanting. Meditation. Okay. Yoga. What was that? Yoga. Yoga. Others. Okay, so service. If you consider, don't doubt it. Own it. <laughs> okay. Um, Early, I think it was this year, um, I wrote a blog post um, for the new year. And look at your house. What rooms in your house serve your body? Okay, your bathroom. In the kitchen, in the bedroom. In the bedroom. <laughs> Which rooms in your house serve your mind? My balcony, side of the living room, and my balcony. Your balcony? To think? You go out there to think? Yeah, I think they want to. At least the living area and the terrace where I do all the ceremonies. Okay, is that serving your mind or your spirit? So where in the room in your house serves your mind? Your office? You have an office, a computer? My living room. Bathroom. Bathroom. Okay. And most of us don't have a space. We're in a different environment. We're talking big picture. Mm -hmm. right. Most people do not have a meditation room or a yoga space or space for ceremony. And so if you look at the condition of humanity and the people that are going to be coming to you, 
you ask them, you teach them about this mind-body-spirit triad, and you ask them where is spirit in their life, and if the home is a manifestation of who we are, people don't have space dedicated in the Western world to their spirit. Now, you go to India, I don't care if it's the size of this. There is a puja room. There is a space with the God that they pray to and their incense where they do their prayers. So inherent in the culture, they have a space for it. And all we do in this culture is push the spirit out. How many times a week do I hear, if I have time? I had no time to do my spiritual homework this week, Francis. No time. It's not the priority. And so one of the things is, again, with the small steps, is putting in tiny, small things where you and your clients can introduce their spirit in small baby steps. So we overwhelm them with chanting or pujas or mantras. That doesn't fit in my life. So how can we honor our spirit on a day-to-day -day basis without really overwhelming a client? If you're thinking that you're seeing a client, you're counseling them on Ayurvedic practices and you're asking them to change things, what is one thing that you can give a client to do that would not change really anything in their life on the outer world, but on the inner world can make a huge difference. We got them write a list, a short list of what you're grateful for. Okay. Just write when you wake up. Okay. So that's what before not going to bed or and before going to bed. Both. Yeah. Okay. What else? Something even simpler. Five minutes closing your eyes and just take a moment to breathe. Okay. So to be present with self. Okay. What else? Something even easier. 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 Breathe. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Okay. Breathe no. fully. Yeah. In and out. Full breathing. Breath. Okay. Very good deep breath. Yeah. Okay. Something even easier. Oh, oh. Everything you're saying is beautiful and it's wonderful. These are great practices and definitely tell your people. But if you have to meet the client where they're at, you have to utilize what they're already doing in their day. What does everybody do? Take a shower. Eats. Everybody eats. What can you do to incorporate a little bit of spirit to start making that spirit? Bless the food. Just say thank you. The food. Bless the food, even as they're stuffing it in their mouth from the McDonald's driving. They can say thank you. That one small tiny step can impact the health of your client. If we don't start introducing <coughs> spirit into people's <coughs> lives in small, tiny, manageable ways, you are not going to get someone to go, You're not. <laughs> You're no. not. It's true. It does not, they leave. And they buy everything you have, and they want it, and they're going to become the yogi of the century. They leave so enthralled when they leave your office. The second they walk out that that door, and they're hit with real life, and that their gas tank is on empty, and that they have to hit the traffic of the palmetto, they have forgotten about all the peace and calm of your space and the smell of incense. Everything gets diluted in the room. Everything. So you have to bring spirit for that triad to work in the most tiniest of spaces. And what is said in breath work? When you hold the breath, that's where you find God, in that space. So you have to find the space where your client can interject God, where they can connect to their spirit. I have this video of Dr. Emoto. He did a lot of research on the water and yeah. how you speak to it. It's just in a minute and 30 seconds, two minutes max. And I send that to my clients. In, during the session, I text it to them right there in the session. And I said, watch this. Not during the session, but like that's the only thing that they do to keep them connected to that session. That I, they dedicate a minute, a minute and a half. And even that sometimes is too much, but you kind of assess your client where they're at. That they can say, oh wow, I can drink this and just say thank you and that impacts? 
So we have to say, Dr. Emoto, E-M-O-T-O, a Japanese physician. Yeah, there is a book as well. I have and done. he studied the molecular structure of water. When you pray, when you say beautiful yes. words to it, Ashley, it, it looks like there's snowflakes, crystal like oh, baccarat yeah. crystals. Have you seen the movie What the Bleep? What's that? What the Bleep? No, no, I saw something else and they, they also talk about where it. they like they throws words like love and hate mm -hmm. and they put them in water. But that's what they're doing. Yes. 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 In the one with love, like froze beautifully and the one with hate like, it was all a mess. Yeah. And so talking about the spirit that of course is connected to the mind and connected to the body. I my dream which is never going to happen, but my dream is that there is a machine, well maybe, right, you never know with all these technology people, that could be hooked up to our mind and would spit out like a paper of everything we thought all day. If we read just a strip this big, think of like one of those EKG strips that came out. Forget all day, an hour. We would be appalled at how we think of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Appalled. And every single one of you made a judgment. And I shouldn't because I'm not there yet. Or oh, I don't know. Or, we're all constantly making excuses and justifying. And so this triad is like, <laughs> I mean, it's constant. Because we're only justifying and justifying and justifying what I should or what I should or what you're saying before the fears and what the judge. And if we could connect a machine one hour for 10 minutes and we could see how we think, then that video really impacts. Because most of them, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I did that. I missed the exit. Oh my God, what a moron. Oh my God, what a jerk. Oh my. We're constantly in a pattern of disease and breaking ourselves down, not building ourselves up. So that one second of interjecting Thank you. May this nourish you. Thank whatever it is. In that space, you're breathing in God. You're creating that puja room that doesn't exist in that person's house. And that's our responsibility. Not getting them to go to satsang. Not getting them to chant for 20 minutes. That's great. That's when you've had the client for 20 years or 10 years or 5 years or 2 years, whatever. And they're like really connected. Because a lot of clients don't come back. It's too overwhelming. It's too much change. So if they can leave with that one thing, you've done your job. It's really important. And I ask you to bring that into your own life. Because we beat ourselves up. We are our worst enemy. And so if you can say at the end of the day, and I ask that you do this, ask yourself every day, what have I done for my body? What have I done for my mind? What have I done for my spirit? And if you can give one thing that you've done on that day for all three of that triad, that was a successful day. That's success. But we hold ourselves to these standards. Woof, talking about the extremes, the addictions that we mentioned before. Those are only going to bring us illness. But if we can take that triad and every day say, what did I do for my body? I ate an apple. Great. We got that check. What did I do for my mind? I read a quote. I opened up a page and I read, or I thought a positive thought to someone about myself. Check. And I said thank you over my food. Doesn't success seem a little bit more doable mm -hmm. when you look at it that way? Instead of the goals and the dream, that that's all ego, that's all the mind will get to that. So it's about making it chunkable and doable. And all of a sudden, if you feel good about yourself and you're out there saying, wow, I did three good things for myself today. I created health in my life with this triad. What do you think the next week is going to look like? To be two things. And then in a year, it's going to be three things. And then next year, it's going to be four. And then you're building a life on health and strength and on the pillars that really matter. Not the values or the things you've created in your mind, your perception 
of what a spiritual person should be or what I should look like. You're going down to that sort of minuscule, the start, the conception of all of this. But we all want to be the guru. We never want to start at the, at the beginning. It starts with one breath. It starts with one positive thought. It starts with one good action. It starts with one healthy meal. So we have to meet ourselves as well as our clients where we are and stop beating ourselves up. And the mind loves to remind us about how crappy we are. That's the ego component. So every day, make your little triangle and say, I did this, this, and this. And that day, you were living Ayurveda. That day, you were creating health and life. So where is the mind located? In your auric field. In your auric field, okay. Yes. Where else? Your emotions start in the heart, huh? Okay, in the heart. Where else? <coughs> Ego. It lives in the ego. Is it located in the ego? Mm-hmm. Located there? Maybe not. If you had to pinpoint a location based on what you've studied to date and your own experiences or a heart, where would you say? It's all pervading. It's the heart. It's in the heart. Okay. All pervading. Heart. Believe that? But are you talking about our own mind or the way we work in mind? No, your, your mind. People's minds. Everyone's mind. It's in our work. Astral body. Okay, the astral body. All of them. All of them. Subtle body. Okay. And you said the heart. And the senses. Where does the Western world think that the mind is located? In the brain. In the brain. Okay. Do you believe that the mind is located in the brain? Okay. Does it's it have the organ of function yeah, exactly. of the body. It's the organ. Remember, organs and senses is how the mind works or works through. But it is not only that. So there is some truth to that. We have intellect. We have the booty part of the mind that resides in the brain if we wanted to locate it. But in the heart, in every cell, Amana Bahasaroga. Do you remember that? Amana is always at the end of everything with Ayurveda, but it's the best. <laughs> okay, so we remember it was in the marma points, it was in Amana Bahasaroga, all of the, the mind, the channel of the mind. Every single cell is mind. Everything in your body. These cells communicate. Okay, it's one of the qualities we'll get to in a second. When the child is conceived or when the baby is growing, what organ is developed at month three? Three months? The I know the heart is the heart. So it's believed that the mind is created, and there's levels to this, at month three, because that's when the heart is created in the child, okay, according to Ayurveda. So it's called Pridraya. The heart. So it's believed that the location is the heart, and it's also in the astral body, which we'll get to when we do more about the body. But know that the channel is the Manavahastrota and that it will, it's located everywhere. Now we're going to talk about in a moment the mind. There's an inner part of the mind and there's an outer part. The inner part of the mind or the inner mind is believed to be in, in the heart. So, and that's how we connect to that's heart. That's heart. Whereas the outer mind, and we'll get into this detail, is the brain. Because that's where the thinking function occurs. So it's not that the West is wrong, it's just that they don't have the understanding of the bodies the way that we do. So we can go more in depth. 
And in Ayurveda regards the heart as the center of consciousness. <clears throat> so when I do like energy work or when I'm gonna do any sort of work in the Akashic Records, I always connect through the heart because that's supposed to be like the purity. That's where you see Hanuman opening his heart. That's where you see the sacred heart of Jesus. So even though we eventually go up the chakra system and we want to connect to the third eye, because from the heart we can fall, so to speak, and that is the place that you enter for that purity to connect to those higher levels. Those are the levels of chin that we'll talk about. So qualities of the mind. The first quality is Anutva. And this means that the mind is atomic instruction. What does it mean to be atomic in structure? What is an atom? An atom is two or more molecules. No, wait. <coughs> Think of the atom. The four molecule comes out. Um, it's the uh, basic or the simplest structure of, oh my God. The building block of everything. everything, yes. An atom is the building block of everything. We just said that everything is mind, all is mind. According to the Kabbalah and according to Hermetic philosophy, all is mind. In Ayurveda, mind is one. Same concept. Everything is one, we know this. It comes from this concept. So, if the atom is the building block of everything, what is the building block of your body? <coughs> the cell. That means that in every single cell of your body is mind. When you tell your body that you're happy, every cell is happy. When you tell your body that you're grieving or you're full of sorrow or you're in pain, Every single cell feels that. There's a wonderful book, it's called The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. He's phenomenal. I like him. And really good. He's he really speaks good. down to earth, but he is really awesome. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. And he really puts this into perspective. This is also the understanding that illness starts in the mind first. And why does a certain part of your body get sick? If it starts with thought, which is that the atom, that sort of building block, it goes to the cell. What is the function of the body? In nature, no matter the body. What's so the need to survive. stay alive? Survival. Bottom line. That's what the ego does. That's why it's mine, mine, mine. My chair. <laughs> because if you invade my property, you can kill me. It's why we put fences. It's why we, you know, we, we scope we out. For everything is, is because of that. So to understand that the body gets sick, how does it protect you? If every single cell is getting the same message. I'm feeling sad, I'm not feeling protected, I'm not feeling safe, I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling grieving, I'm feeling... How does the body compartmentalize so it stays alive? It holds on. It has the intelligence. It holds on to something, and then what does the intelligence do? It does. You have to think, the mind is your whole body. How come we're all, how come I only got breast cancer? How come I didn't get cancer from head to toe? How come the fungus only stayed on the woman's toe? <laughs> <laughs> because of the 
thinking, the wrong thinking, the different whatever you think. So in every cell, if the channel is the Manu Mahastrota, in the whole body, and the function of the body is to protect, to keep itself alive, if I allowed every thought to kill me, then my body wouldn't provide its function. So what does the body do? It isolates so that it can purge it. It adapts. The body isolates it and adapts to what the mind is messaging every cell and the intelligence of the cell says, oh, this is the pancreas. This has nothing to do with me. That's the liver's problem. The person doesn't feel that there's abundance. <laughs> so I'm not getting pancreatic cancer. I'm going to get liver cancer or hepatitis or whatever it is. Because the message that every cell is sending in this person's body is, I don't have enough. Liver, the largest organ other than the skin, it's about abundance. The liver can do everything. Let's push it over to the liver. So the cells go and compartmentalize, just like the tissue, just like the muscle, and it takes your thought and says, well, we can't die. If our whole function is to stay alive, I'm going to take that and I'm going to send it to the part of the body that has the message that I'm trying to tell this human being and the world that's wrong with me. So I get liver disease or some sort of something and I know that it's related to the person having way too much excess in their life or fear of not having, lack of abundance. So this is such amazing intelligence, but it starts in the mind. But in order for the body to preserve itself and to stay alive, if not, we'd all be dead. Because we have fears constantly. The mind is sending those signals. But the mind is everywhere. All is mind. Read that Kabbalion. It's seriously, it's like 10 pages. It is <laughs> phenomenal. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And that's the first law. Again, going back to your philosophy of life, whether it's Egyptian, whether it's Ayurvedic, it doesn't matter. The, the truth is the truth. And so your body will take this message that you keep sending, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough. That you're doing it, you do it in one area, you do it in every area. And you even do it so much in every area that the part of your body that represents that message gets sick. And then you've got two things. You look if the person needs more of it or if they need less of it. And that's when you see the deterioration of something versus the, the, the growing more of like a cancer situation or like an osteoporosis situation. So you can as a practitioner say, I know that mind is everything. The person's thought is what got them sick. What is the function of that organ that they're sick? And then you can see if they have too much or too little. And so within two seconds, you've got the person pretty pegged. Then you go into, of course, the doshas and all of that. But it's all going to say the same picture. So you need to incorporate the mental status of the client, not just the physical. Because if we go back to the definition of health, it's not just the doshas, it's not just the mala, it's also the mind. So you're saying, like you were saying, when when something, when you, when you say something but you don't feel it, or like you believe something but you don't feel it, and that's creating disease. Say you know it's something that's good for you, but you're still not to the point where you feel it. Do you continue saying and believing it until you feel it? Or is that just Can you give me an example? Because I'm thinking the first thing that I'm going to say when I don't think it's the truth, mm -hmm. it's the first thing we all do when we're going to say something that we don't believe. <coughs> we clear our throat. We're making way for this lie. Yeah. So that's what comes to mind. Like, could you give me more of a specific example that I can answer the question probably better? Well, are you trying, are you saying in yourself so that you can convince yourself that it's good? Yeah, well, no, not convince yourself that it's good, but like something that you know is good, 
or that you know you're supposed to think a certain way or feel a certain way about something, but you don't feel that way yet. Okay, because you say you know it's good and you don't feel it, right. and that's one of the functions is the duality. It's not health. You have to go to the core. What is your philosophy that you have to question? Guilt is a perfect example. Everybody feels guilt. Why do we feel guilt? Raise your hand if you believe in the law of karma. Every single one of us believes in the law of karma in this room. How many of you feel guilt? Why? What is the law of karma? You have everything that you're supposed to have, good or bad. You earned it. You earned it. You killed someone or you did a good deed. Why the guilt? If someone comes and gives you a sack of money, why do you, oh, I feel so bad. How many times a day do we say that? So are you honoring your philosophy? Because if you really honor your philosophy, that's where you have to question, is that truly your philosophy? That's where the illness is residing. I know it's good for me. Why? Because your mind told you? Because your parents told you? That's your homework assignment. Question the value. Oh, I know it's good. How the hell do you know if we just said that all of it is reality, that the mind creates a reality and it's all a perception? How do you know? So unless you have a philosophy to stand on, that confirms it, that we've already established is based on truth, no matter what the philosophy, then you're not really in this. And that's where the disease thinks. Now that's judgment. And judgment is here, and judgment is illness. Because it's an erroneous thing. It's not rooted in truth. Truths don't make us feel bad. Truths don't make us sick. The sattvic mind can't get vitiated. Only the rajasic and the tamasic. Because if you're at peace with what you feel, say, believe, do, then you're at peace. Then your only responsibility is to transcend that and remember that you're the child of God and the divine spark. But there, it's the mind. You're, you're like beating yourself, trying to put a square peg in a round hole. And you have to question where you got the measurements from. Who told you that this is the size of the peg? <laughs> we have to do that work. We have to. If we don't do that work, we are not going to get better. And Western psychology does not address this, people. They give you a pill. And they tell you, talk about it, talk, 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 I'm an alcoholic, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm an alcoholic. Can we change that thought, please? Can we go a little deeper? I'm not criticizing, I think that 12-step program is wonderful, I'm just giving you the example. Then all we become is talking heads, repeating our story, and we believe our story, we make and our story. And we're everything. And we run around with our garbage bag mm -hmm. from our problems. Oh, this is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And this is my story. Change your story. Change your mind, change your story. So the judgment there is what I hear is a big piece. So you have to get where you're judging. Where is the illness? Where did the stool break? It's somewhere here. And eventually, it's going to reach here. Because once it processes into the body, it reaches, once we, we manifest it into the deeper elements, then we, have, we get illness in the body. But we have to question that. I should. It's good. Who told you? Do you know, and we'll see this when we go into the chittas and into the causal body, that we are carrying loyalties and weights from your ancestors, ancestors, ancestors that you don't even believe, that you don't even know where they came from? So you're holding yourself hostage for something that you don't even know where it trickled down the line. And that's why unless we have a solid philosophy that forces us to question it, we guilt. We all have guilt and we all believe in karma. Therefore, we're all ill. Because we are not being true to one piece of the triad. 
So every time we feel guilty, we've just created illness. We've told every cell, and where do you hold grief? Liver. It can handle everything, it's so big. <laughs> okay. And the next quality is a cut Okay, Eric. <laughs> The tool that does it all. <laughs> Erica's mind does everything at once all the time, according to her description of her dough art supply cutter thing. Okay, <laughs> this quality, yes. Yes, that's when you learn to listen and perceive, yes. Said there's no such thing as multitasking. The mind can only focus one sense at a time. So when I bring you a slice of pizza, do you smell it? Do you taste it? What, what's going on first? You have no clue. All this damn pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but you shouldn't have it. Because <laughs> somewhere that was said, right? <laughs> there is no multitasking, no such thing. This is the quality. Your mind can only do single pointed. So I was interviewed for this uh, this woman that I know was doing these interviews called Interviews with Incredible Women. And she sent this list of questions that you had to answer. And then from there, she interviewed you, but she already had like the basis. And one of them was about multitasking. Like you, and I'm still guilty. I haven't surpassed it all that much, but I pretend. Um, <laughs> I used to claim myself the multitasking. But like that was like a label that I wore with such pride. Oh, I can listen to you, listen to her, be teaching a class over here, feeding my kid on my breast over there, like cooking the soup. I, I thought that that was the thing. Like, oh my god. So you get older and you realize that first of all you're doing nothing right. So as I got older, I realized this was not a quality. This was not true. So when I got interviewed, it's online somewhere. That was one of the questions. And I said that. And I used to consider, because she asked something about multitasking. Because she's like, oh, you do so much, or whatever. And I said, no, there's no such thing. Like, you can only do one thing at a time, especially if you want to do it right. And so we're in a society where you're supposed to multitask. Mm -hmm. It is like you're obliged. Kids, there was a study done with little children that if the, when they record like a cartoon, they have like these clips per minute like in the reel of the video, that if it didn't have 37 of those click things per second or per minute, the kids were bored. They could not watch it. Remember, some of us were the MTV generation? That was the beginning of it. Now it's horrible. You, you can't, you can't. We can't handle the computer not loading fast enough. Mm -hmm. We now, when we design our web pages, you have a whole different design for your cell phone because the computer speed is too slow for the phone speed. We're ingesting through the senses more and more and more, and we're supposed to keep up can't because the mind is not created that way that is not the quality of the mind is that it's single pointed so how are we supposed to find the inner spark the child of God the all and oneness in ourselves if we're constantly go 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 we, we can't and so all of the activities that we that we get involved in spiritually is to remind us and to bring us this this point. So in I think it's the Gita and Vedanta they talk about it like the lake that the mind is like a lake 
And only when it's clear can you actually see to see your true self. But anytime it has ripples, you can't. Oh, it Ashley and I do yoga on my deck. And there are times that she'll say, let's do tree pose. And we look at the lake and we both fall. We can't be in tree pose and we look at something more steady. That's happened to us quite a few times because the, it's moving. So that is what we're focusing on. So of course, that's the message we're sending. The water isn't still, we can't be still. So when we're chanting the name of God, when we're in prayer, when we're in silence, we're in meditation, all we're trying to do is get back to doing the oneness. So, to bring to the client, have your client do one thing. When they're eating lunch, have them eat lunch. When they're typing the email to their boss, have them type the email to their boss. That's a practice that most of us do not engage in that you can bring to your client to say, this is one of the ways to calm your mind. It's not meditation, it's not chanting, but it's still bringing them back to, let's bring it down to the function of the mind. Because we're actually kidding ourselves when we think. So what we tend to do, and it's funny because Diana kind of showed that earlier with the tool, we have this thought, and all of a sudden we're transported to the mom that was there with you. I'm, I'm a cancer woman, so oh my god, memory for me is like, oh, take me on your journey. I was there with my mom doesn't sew, my mom, but I already saw my mom sewing me. Give me the grass. I mean, I was there imagining something that never happened. So that's what we do. We connect one, that's another quality. We're constantly jumping one to one to one. We're connecting one thought to the next. When in reality, our thoughts have nothing to do with one another. If you ever do the activity of just sitting, which is one of the basic meditations, where you're supposed to just observe the thought. You're not supposed to judge you, you're not supposed to quiet the mind, none of that. Basic, basic medita meditation strategy, just sit and observe. Oh, I saw a bear. Okay, let the bear go. Oh, I saw a postal uh, a stamp. Oh, let it go. And you just do. At the end of two minutes or 30 seconds, you saw a bear, you saw a stamp, you saw a pair of earrings, you saw a curtain. Ask yourself, what did any of these have in common? Nothing. Nothing. That is your entire life. What you are doing is you're connecting the thought of this moment to the thought of last year, the thought of last month, and the thought of 10 years ago, and now your story of your life has been created. And now you're an alcoholic, and now you're this, and now you're that, and now you're da, 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 da. And you've connected. You have two options. Your story can thread all the wonderful things, or your story can thread all the horrible things. And then you think that every time you get a car accident, or every time you get this and this and this is going to happen, and you've threaded them like pearls on a necklace, when in reality they have nothing to do with one another. But that's what the mind is constantly telling us. Because the mind, one of the qualities, is constantly jumping from one thing to the next. In this book that I said, this Living and Lightning book, he talks about it, he calls it a thought shaft. And we have these shafts of thought, and we like put them in there, like a pinball kind of machine. So this meant this, meant this, meant this, meant this. That means if this happens, that happens. But really, they're just like the bear and the postal stamp and the earrings and the current. They have nothing to do. It is what we, the value that we give it, the belief that we give it, that it's positive or negative or it's good or it's bad. But really, the, con the constant jumping from thought to thought. What's the Sanskrit word? I don't know. Oh, I could get it for you, but I don't know. Do you know? Where is it? The Sanskrit word for the constant jumping from thought to thought is a little bit of a leap. The next one is atendria. Okay. 
and this means it's beyond the sense organs. So it's constantly jumping from thing to thing to thing. That they're not correlated, we correlate it. Okay. So this is that it's beyond the sense organs. Remember when we did the covering of the ears and the eyes and the nostrils and we saw silence? That's a great meditation for you. You can do that on the bus or on the train when you're on your way to work. Okay, perfect. I mean, so you would know. Yeah, I have it, at, and you would know, but I, because I, I, I have done it before. I learned that in Kriya Yoga, uh -huh. um, and it was called Brahmari with full Sham Muki Mudra. Muki is face. Okay, so I looked up the. Is this yeah. the the duality? No, part that's of next. We'll be able to do that. So this means that it's beyond the sense organs. You don't need your sense organs in order for you to think. They're not related in the sense. Your sense organs are not in your physical body, so to speak, in the astral, in the astral body. Okay, so that's why when you cover your senses, you can connect to that true self. Okay. Um, the sense organs only function with the mind. But the mind doesn't need the sense organs. Mm. I have a question. Mama, yes. I like that bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Go a second. It's, it's on steadiness, but I don't know if we can apply for that. It's okay. I like that Can you spell that? A N A I can pick up with a K. That's like kind of like unsteadiness, like so variable. That it's unsteadiness or variable, <clears throat> but I'm not sure if in that context it will. I happen. think so because that's the quality. The mind isn't steady. <laughs> um, we have to work to get it to that. Thank you. What was your question? Ash? Well, and maybe it's just kind of <laughs> thinking out loud. I wonder if maybe you've read anything or if there's a way that we could look this up. If um, individuals with certain senses that are not like blind people, for example, or deaf people, if maybe they suffer from less disease than people with all senses intact. I wonder if there's ever been a study done or I don't know of any, but I figure that if they say that when you lose sense in one sense, that the others become more heightened. Mm -hmm. And if we're saying that it's the thought that's really motoring, if you will, the senses, mm -hmm. and not the actual eyes, and if another sense is taking over mm -hmm. to double, my hunch would be no. But it's something definitely to look up and see if there is something. But I would not think so, especially based on this idea. Okay. That if thought is really the, the ruling force, not so the senses. And we we know when we are in the dreamer state <clears throat> that we are still out of the senses, but we're still purging and having dreams and having things dealing with issues that we couldn't deal with in our regular life. So I would think that for that person, that it would be a similar experience. But it is something to look up and to see if it's been done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I So this, the, the quality is, there is no stillness in the mind, only beyond the mind. And we will get to that. So I think so. I think that that might be. Um, the same concept. <clears throat> My favorite. <laughs> the mind is dualistic. Did someone sigh? <laughs> okay. First of all, I'm an addict of mythology. Okay. And Joseph Campbell is the father of mythology. Father Joseph Campbell said, 
There is no good deed that you do that isn't evil for something. And I think that really sums this up nicely. 